like to start by thanking the organizers, Sergei and all the team, for bringing me here. It's always a good experience to, to come to Russia, even if we, we have a mega grant with Nizhny Novgorod, okay? But we, I've never been to, to Sochi. That's a good occasion. So the, the topic of my, my, lect, my, my tutorial will be very simple, okay? So in principle, this is a, a school on quantum technologies. So roughly speaking, quantum technologies is the use of quantum resources to provide performances to a system that cannot be achieved at the classical level. So if uh, I think in what are the resources we need, the previous talk by Marco was, okay, entanglement, blah, blah, blah. So my first question is, okay, we live in a quantum world, or we want to exploit the quantum world. My question is, what is the most classical state allowed by quantum mechanics? Sorry? A thermal? You think so? A coherent state, okay. So uh, this project I'm talking today about started uh, more or less eight years ago. So say, Roger Penrose turned 80, and I was invited to the symposium in Oxford in his honor, and I was talking about coherent states. And then, of course, Penrose was supposed to ask an intelligent, smart question, he raised his hands and asked me, oh, you quantum guys are always talking about what is the most classical state allowed by quantum mechanics. Can you tell me what is the most quantum state allowed by quantum mechanics? You think so? Okay, this is... Okay, I hope to, after one hour and a half, convince you what is the proper answer. And the answer is, well, that, sorry? A vacuum. Okay, could be. I mean, let me, let me, let me try to, to settle the scenario to say, what is the most quantum state, so the most reliable resource for doing quantum task? So this, uh, this is just uh, the idea to present this. And, uh, and then to explore what are these uh, extremal, extremal quantum states we want to use, okay, and to produce. Uh, so uh, as a proof that I'm a real quantum guy, I live in a quantum superposition between uh, the Max Plan in Erlangen. I'm sorry because this is a poor PDF, but the Mac is not working here. And uh, this is in Erlangen, where I more or less in charge of the theory group there, and then in Madrid. So I live in this superposition. And this project, along this last uh, eight year, was uh, involved in a lot of different groups. So Gerloix in, in uh, Marcus Grassel in, in Erlangen, a former uh, professor in, in Lebedev that now for many years is in, in Mexico, Andrei Klimov. Some of the experiments has been performed in, in the KTH, in the Royal. the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. Uh, so it's Denek Radil and uh, Jarda Rehacek in Olomoc. He's here sitting. Also, the last experiments are being, have been performed in the group of, um, of Bob Boyd and Ibrahim Karimi in the University of Ottawa. And last but not least, this is uh, a recent student from Ephraim Steinberg who, who just, uh, and, um, and Daniel James, who is uh, helping us in the project. So, in, in short, uh, the idea is classical or non-classical. So this is a classification we, we were just writing right now, uh, recently with Claude Favre. The idea is, uh, what is the question? Classical or non-classical? And so uh, the idea is, uh, what is uh, a classical? 
a classical phenomenon. Okay? So, uh, in principle, I would, I would say that a classical phenomena, phenomenon is that one that can be described both using Maxwell equations, what we call classical electrodynamics, and uh, with classical mechanics. So, Newton equations. And of course you can say, oh, we are experimentalists. I'm not, but I'm in just in case. And then you have statistical fluctuations that can be introduced easily in the model on the physical parameters. So, what is a quantum phenomena? Roughly speaking, I would say that the quantum phenomena is this in which there is H bar somewhere in the properties. You cannot avoid the properties. So from that point of view, I ask again, you think a classic, uh, coherent state is a classical state? It's not classical. It's quantum state, but it's more classical okay, than but it's, other basis. Okay, it's classical because the fluctuations of a coherent state depends on H bar, okay? And what is a semi-classical phenomenon? It's, it's either can be described by classical electrodynamics, but not by classical mechanics. So you can take the field as classical, but not the, mater not the material system. Or you can uh, describe the, 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 the material system by classical mechanics, but not the field. So in a way, non-classical light, this is the, the standard name people use, okay? Non-classical light. But you know, if we are quantum guys, everything is quantum. So every, every light is quantum. So one should talk about the quantumness of light, not the non-classical of light. But I mean, people is talking about this. So at least one of these properties cannot be explained by this theory. So either, well, the intensity fluctuations are subquasonian, either the G2 is less than one, or either there is no positive global Sudarshan representation. When this uh, happens, we say there is non-classical light. So we have classical light on the other hand, we have non-classical light. But what is the border? And the border is just coherent states. So let me start by just uh, trying to recall in a very brief way what is a coherent state. So in principle, uh, you, you have a system which is described in terms of continuous variables, a single mode of the oscillator, uh, you know, and then you describe in terms of two Hermitian, Hermitian operators position and momentum that we know that at the quantum level they don't commute. So they close what is in mathematical terms called the Heisenberg Weil algebra. Okay? And now we want to represent this uh, system in terms of phase space. You can say, what? What is phase space at the quantum level? So I'm not entering into the details, but there is a solid and very deep and sound theory how to construct a, a, a phase space at the, at the quantum level. It's, it's called the orbits under the coaction action and was developed mostly by Kirillov in Moscow, but also Constant and Suryo in Paris, okay? So, but the idea is, well, in principle, I mean, you have a position, you have momentum, both are unbound, so you have a plane. This is the more or less the phase space, okay? And then look at these guys. So I have this, which is the exponential of the momentum. Well, we know how this operator acts on a wave function, okay? This operator displaces in X. Everybody knows that, okay? And this one, when you have P here, displaces in P. So this means that you can put this together. So you displace in X and displace in P, or you displace in P and then in X. So at the quantum, at the quantum level, these this two displacements 
are not the same. But they add a face. So in fact, this, this way of writing the non-commutativity is from the mathematical point of view much more convenient because these guys are, have bad properties, but these are unitary operators. But more than unitary operators or not, these guys can be controlled in the lab. I will show you in a minute. And then this way of writing this, this, this uh, commutation relation was put forward by Weil at the beginning of quantum mechanics. And these are called the Weil unitary form of the commutation relations. And again, they say nothing more than you cannot displace as you usually do in the plane. So once you do that, okay, you can um, put this guy together and say, look, I can displace an X and can displace in P. And if you put them together, you have something that displaces your state in any point of the phase space. So this guy is usually written in this way, and this is called the displacement. OK, this is the displacement operator. <laughs> Doesn't work. But this is a classical displacement, sure. That's OK. I'm not using that, OK? I can use the other one. Don't worry. So the, from this point of view, uh, a coherent state is just to the uh, displace version of anything you want to displace. So you apply the displacement operator. Uh, and of course, alpha is just the complex variable representing both position and momentum. So it's the complex version of x plus ip, OK? So by the way, this displacement operator in the lab can be easily implemented having a beam splitter and a laser of amplitude alpha. You mix with the state and in the limit in which the reflectivity of the beam splitter tends to zero is a perfect displacement. So this means that we can control in the lab one, and they can control in the lab this displacement. And now what we need is just to, to tell what is the state we want to photocopy, they want the state we want to clone. And say immediately say, look, the standard definition that this, this way of was done by Askol Pieralamov is just uh, what do you want to displace? And you say the vacuum, because it's, well, why the vacuum? Is there any good reason to displace the vacuum? Well, there is some reasons, OK? Because we want to display something which is a minimum uncertainty state. We want to display something which is uh, the minimum, the fundamental state, in a way. So the minimum energy. And by the way, the vacuum has a good property from the point of view of mathematics that can be easily extended when you go to another symmetry, is that the vacuum is the only state which is Fourier transform of itself. So in the language of the beams, it's a non-diffracting beam, the only one. But this is so good. So this is the picture we have. We have a coherent state, and this is a minimum uncertainty state. From this point of view is the idea that is the most classical state allowed by quantum mechanics because it has a classical amplitude, a classical phase, but you have fluctuations. And these fluctuations in these x and p variables are equally distributed. So they are Gaussian functions in x, and they are Gaussian functions in p. This is the idea. And uh, of course, if you go to the number basis, the, the, the basis of the eigenstates of the energy, so photon numbers, the statistics of these states, we know, is a Poissonian. 
with average number of photons n, okay? Good. Again, what, is, what are the, the, the standard properties of these guys we are interested in to describe systems at the classical level, okay? So we saw one of them, they are minimum uncertainty states, but even more, they satisfy the classical equations of motion. So they evolve like a classical system with minimum fluctuations. And now, as a mathematical property, they have an overcomplete, they, they form a basis, but it's an overcomplete basis. There are many more elements than needed. And now you remember when I give you a vector in Hilbert space, you need to work with the vector in a, I mean, it's when you are in physics one on one, give you a vector and say, no, no, don't give me the vector, give me the components. To give the components, you need to project the vector on your coordinate axis, okay? So what we do in quantum mechanics, we project over the coordinates. What are the coordinates? If you project over position, you have the standard wave function, but you can project over the momentum, and then you have the momentum wave function. And then the question is, cannot we project over two of those? Because at the classical level is possible, you have a distribution, Liouville distribution, that gives you what is the probability of finding your system with that position and that momentum. Can we do that at the quantum level? The answer is no, because the observables don't commute. And this prescribes that there is a minimum. But in principle, you can project over these spaces. And then instead of having a wave function which is in position or in momentum, you have a wave function which is simultaneously in position and in momentum. It's the coherent state wave function, okay? And now, give me, give me just a, a second, okay? And you introduce here the number states. So this state has this number represent. So this is the statistic of this state in, of the number basis. And then you have this guy, because we know that alpha, the coherent state in the, coherent, in the number basis is a Poissonian. Look at this. This is just a polynomial. And a polynomial can be completely characterized by the zeros. So welcome to the Majorana representation. So it's enough to know the zeros of this function to know the states. So we, we claim that all the quantum mechanics we want to do is just chasing, hunting zeros, because the zeros are just the representation. So this, this function, which is this probability, is just a probability distribution of simultaneous measurements of x and p. Of course, we know because of the uncertainty relations, that there cannot be a sharp simultaneous measurement of X and P. But you can make a non-sharp, a fuzzy simultaneous determinate measurement of X and P. This is this function that was introduced in the 1954 by Hosimi, a Japanese guy by a different methods. And this is, in a way, is a way, the proper way of representing a state in phase space. You can say, oh, there are another representations, Bigner or P function. Why not using that? There are good reasons not to use that for this purpose. And I hope that reasons will be clear along the talk. Now the question is, OK, let's go back to the idea of going to uh, classical or quantum states. Of course, there is a lot of, uh, of works trying to quantify non-classicality. In fact, especially after this resource theory for everything now, which is cool, okay? The idea is, I mean, we know what the classical states we, we want to have is coherent states. If we have a, a state 
which is non-coherent state, let's try to calculate the distance from that state to the set of coherent states. This is the idea of resource theory. But incidentally, apart from Martin Plinio putting that in the, in the, in the spot, OK? This, the first idea of using this distance came by Manco and Mark Hillary trying to make a non-classical criterion saying what is the distance between a state and the set of coherent states. But I don't want to have a classif I don't want to have a classification, a, a degree of non-classicality. I want just to show what is the most opposite, the most quantum state. So uh, some years ago, in the 60s, Hermann Bell, is a mathematical physicist in Vienna, said, look, there is a way to characterize uh, the quantum properties of a state is the von Neumann entropy. But we know that the von Neumann entropy is zero for any pure state. And of course, if we want to look for the opposite of a coherent, a coherent state, the first characteristic of a coherent state is that it is a pure state. So we want to have a pure state, which is the most opposite to a coherent state. So this guy said, look, why don't make a formal definition of the von Neumann entropy, but replacing the probability of von Neumann by the Q function. The Q function is just this joint distribution of in, 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 in phase space. So you have the Q function of the state, and this is the logarithm, this is the standard definition. So, Leap, Elliot Leap, conjectured that the ent this Bell entropy is always greater than one. And he proved, in fact, that this one, if and only if, the state is coherent. So coherent states minimize Bell entropy. So incidentally, I was, uh, when I was uh, a student of quantum, I was a student of Elliot Leap, and this was in the prehistory. But he was making some conjecture about something I was telling you, and he managed to prove that 27 years focus on the problem, to 2012, just to prove this famous conjecture I will tell you. Now, the question is, OK, from the point of view of this entropy, which is good because entropy, because of the logarithm, has all the powers of Q, all the moments of the state. The question is, can we try to calculate what is the, more, the, the state that maximizes the Bell entropy? And the answer is yes. This is very simple. It's a very simple task if we impose a minimum requirement, which is the fixed energy. And then the answer is the most opposite to coherent state is what? It's the thermal state. It's not the most classical. It's the most quantum. But the thermal state is a mixed state. So what is the most opposite to a coherent state from the point of view of the entropy? The maximal entropy is a number state. You were right, of course. Well, but intuitively it's clear. I understand. Of course. Uh, sure, sure. But the question is, is not now. Because the quantum mechanics should quantize stuff, right? Hmm? And most classic, the most quantum state should be larger. Okay. No, no. But this is, by the way, this is my answer to the question that that day. Okay. But the question is. The question is, what is the problem here? Okay, the problem here is that this guy, I told, I told you, is a polynomial. But how many powers has this polynomial? Infinite power, infinite roots. So continuous variables are a disaster for this point of view. And this, I want to to examine the problem from the point of view of an angular momentum. And the reason will appear very soon, OK? So let, let me consider a system 
which is just uh, a typical angular momentum. I mean, this can be angular momentum from an electron, spin, anything which is this symmetry as you two. So what is the phase space? I mean, you, this is the Casimir. This means intuitively, I, we don't want to enter into all these cosets and all that, that the phase space is a, is a sphere of radius s, more or less, okay? It's, you, call, you can call that the Bloch sphere, you can call that the Poincare sphere, you can call that the Riemann sphere, the celestial sphere, the CP1, however you want. It's always the unit sphere, okay? You find this in many instances, okay? Then the question is, okay, we know that these subspaces in which you have 2s plus 1 states are, I mean, <coughs> span an irreducible representation. So the state has a fixed angular moment, a fixed spin. And of course, what's the problem here? That we have an uncertainty principle. So in classical physics, people doing classical polarization says, oh, this is my state of polarization, and points a point in the Poincare sphere. But here, oh, sorry. But here, you have this noise, so you have fluctuations. What does it mean that there is intrinsic noise because these guys cannot be simultaneously measured. And this means that you cannot talk about a Poincare sphere, but a Poincare onion. You need to talk about the onion and to peel, to parse the onion in layers because there is fluctuations. Okay, so you need to, to peel the orange. So good. Uh, by, by the way, this is a bit abstract, but in any case, we have plenty of problems in which you have two modes. That's the case of polarization. That's the case of Bose-Einstein condensate, shade, Gaussian models. So we all, you always can map your problem from two modes, whatever the modes are, to these guys. And this, this was done in a fantastic paper that was rejected, by the way, by Julian Schwinger. And now it's called the Schwinger representation. So any two-mode problem can be mapped in a spin. Feynman, two-level. You know, the most cited paper by Richard Feynman? You say, oh, path integrals, renormalization, Nobel Prize. No, it's a paper in which, when he was preparing his lectures, was showing that any two-level atom is a spin one half. It's published in Applied Physics Letters. It's the most cited paper by him. Pity that he didn't read uh, Schwinger because they didn't go along very well, okay? Because everything was there. So by the way, this paper by Schwinger is reprinted in this Biedenhardt um, collection, which is called Angular Momentum. So in principle, you, ne you need to take the spin, the equivalent, equivalent spin is just the total number of excitations, and the third component is just the difference between two, okay? Doesn't matter. And now the question is, can we define a coherent state here? And this was performed, I mean, the original paper was by Tito Arecki, I mean, Gilmore, all this famous paper on atomic coherent states, okay? And the idea was, yes, we can. How? The idea is just to make the same as before, a displacement operator. And this is the displacement operator, but forget about mathematics. If you think that polarization is SU2, this guy is just the action of a quarter wave plate plus a half wave plate. So you put that on your state, and theta and phi are just the angle of the... So people in this quantum polarization knows. Again, the question is, this is not mathematics. It's just the way you can control the physics, okay? And now they say, look, I want to displace. What should I displace? What is the vacuum here? What is the vacuum? So, but then remember, we have... Uh, states that go from minus s to plus s. What is the vacuum? The two limit states, either the, the lower one, and then you go to the south pole. Tito Arecchi did that, but he was Italian. What to say, I mean. 
I go to the north, okay? This is much more, we are in the north, okay? And then you take, you displace this state over the sphere. So again, this is displacing the vacuum over the sphere. It's essentially the same. And what are the properties? The, how much time do I have? Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay, good. So, uh, so again, this is a minimum uncertainty state. So this means, what is a spin? A spin is a vector that points in a one direction. In the unit, in the unit sphere. But we know that in the quantum mechanics, there is not a, po a vector pointing in one direction. Fluctuates. So this guy fluctuates with minimum fluctuations. These guys satisfy the classical equations of motion. And these guys are also a over complete basis. Can I project over these guys? Yes, we can. And this is the idea. I project over this basis, okay? And then I get this. These are the coefficient of the state in that basis. So my elements of the, my state in the angular momentum basis. And I have this guy. So look, this is alpha. And this guy is related to theta and phi, which are the polar angles on a sphere. And this is something that is called the stereographic projection. Everybody knows what a stereographic projection is, more or less? I, okay. <laughs> so the idea is you have a sphere and you have a plane. You puncture the sphere here. You take a, right, a, a line and you say this is alpha and this guy is theta phi. Okay? So this means that everybody understands that this means that I can pass can you, I can pass from alpha to a point in the sphere but this guy is a polynomial but this is a finite polynomial how many terms has minus s 2 plus s 2s plus my 2s plus 1 so how many roots 2s roots this is the majorana polynomial you know about Majorana. Of course, uh, this is, uh, Majorana was one of the, probably the most, I don't know, the smartest student of Fermi. And he, he, was a, he got a professorship when he was 20 ages in Naples. But he was from Sicily, from Catania, but he was living in Palermo. So he was commuting every weekend from Naples to Palermo in a boat. And then uh, one Sunday, coming back to Naples, he, he disappeared when he was 34. And, no, 34. and nobody knows what happened. And of course, every guy in Palermo, every Palermitano has a theory what happened with Majorana, of course. Was killed, committed suicide, math, 30, before, uh, uh, shortly before, the, before. Just me before. He was a tycoon in, in Venezuela. He was a monk in Tibet. Everyone. But the last paper he wrote was uh, uh, atoms oriented in a magnetic field. It's a pity that probably his best paper, in my view, now everybody talks about Majorana matrices, Majorana modes, Majorana fermions. However, this Majorana plot are only in Italian. It's not, it's not available in English, which I don't, I don't know why, because the paper is really, really nice. And the idea is precisely, you represent a spin by a, rep, a plot on the sphere. Let me, this, this guy is the Q function experimentally determined by Mark Kasevich in US. So this is for a Bose-Einstein condensate with 50, 100 atoms. 
and you say this is the Q function. So this is the probability distribution over the Bloch sphere, Poincaré sphere, and you see, oh, sure, you have here a maximum. So it's like a big grain on the sphere, okay? However, if you look carefully at the back of this grain, you will discover that it is a zero. You know what this state is? This is the Q function of state, which you see, the Q function is maximal at the North Pole, but this state has a very strange belly. This is a new state with N photons. And you say, how to produce a noon state with photons? Well, they are now noon state with three photons, but they are, this is a noon state with spins, okay? And this in, in, in both sides in condenses can be immediately generated. And now the question is, look, this is zero is blue navy, red is maximal, so it's mountain valley, mountain valley, mountain valley. Instead of that, let's look at the zeros. You dig carefully here and say, look, this is the Majorana constellation. Of course, if you plan that your, uh, your picture is chosen by the editor to the kaleidoscope, this is better. But if you want to st study the state in, in deep, this is better. This is the Majorana constellation. Now, the leap conjecture. This was, this, this is uh, the conjecture that Leaf was working, started to work in 1979. The idea is you can define this Bell entropy, which is the entropy defined in terms of the Q function, which is, okay, we saw this is the Q function. And then what is the Bell entropy? The Bell entropy is, this one, and it's always bigger than this, and the minimum of the Bell entropy is a coherent state. So a coherent state is the most classical state. Now the question is, what is the state of maximum Bell entropy? Nobody knows. And this is linked to a series of problems. I mean, a coherent state is a sum of Fock uh, states, and here a coherent it's a binomial. It's ah, okay. A binomial. So, so it's a new definition of a coherent for no, no, the no. spin it's, case. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's, a, it's a, bino a binomial distribution of states. This is the definition of a coherent state in this basis. Mm -hmm. But if you want, this is the definition of coherent state is the displaced version of the North Pole. Now, there is a, a series of problems that are explicitly linked with this, and they are still waiting for a solution. For example, in my, this is the famous Thompson problem. There is one of the millennium. One million dollars is waiting for you. Okay? So imagine you are in a sphere. It's a, just a sphere. It's a conducting sphere and you put an electron there, okay? So this is this related to this famous Thomson theorem in electrostatics. You say in a metal, all the electrons are on the surface. So you put a metal, a sphere, and you put an electron. And there is a Coulomb is a repulsion. What is, and you put a second electron. If the first one you put in the North Pole, what is the second one? Sorry? In the, south, in the South Pole, okay? And you put the third one. What is the third one? More or less on the equator, okay? And the fourth one. Then we can solve the problem numerically, but there is no analytical solution to the problem. But there are many more problems like that. For example, Tam's problem. Tam's was uh, a botanist, and he was studying under the microscope, what is the distribution of poles, holes in the pollen? This is, there is also something which is called the Todd's problem. 
all of them are without solution. What is the, the thought problem? It's just uh, what are you to put a set of points in such a way that the minimal distance between them is maximum? Uh, just, just uh, there is a doctoral school in Perth, in Australia, in, in which is just placing points on the sphere, and this is really a fantastic problem, and this is one of the problems. So we have some solutions of maximal entropy for some dimensions. You see, for example, this, the Thomson problem, the Toth problem with two points, two, the two is, uh, configurations are opposite. The three ones, the four is the tetrahedron. This is the hoptahedron. Whenever this constellation puts in a platonic solid, everything was fine. Otherwise, it's a numerical problem. Now the question is good, good. This was good enough. Now, let's go back to you, you. I've shown you right now what is the most opposite from the point of view of entropy. Now, let's think in more physical terms, OK? So we know that the most classical states are the coherent states. What is a coherent state? A coherent state is a, a spin. It's a vector that points in a direction as more as uh, as, much, uh, as, uh, uh, as nearly as possible, okay? What is the opposite to that? Is a vector which points nowhere. Can you give me a, an, an idea of what is a vector that points nowhere? Zero. Zero. But in polarization, what's that? The zero of the Poincare sphere, what's that? The unpolarized state. Sorry? Zero. Is the, unp the unpolarized state? Maybe. We'll, we, I mean, this is the, precisely the point. But the question is, re we really want to, to have an unpolarized state? So a, a state that points to nowhere is at the origin. But that's enough. So because the coherent states have properties to every moment, they factorize correlation functions to every moment. So we should go moment by moment. And I will explain to you immediately. So from that point of view, the first guy who was studying that was um, some former student of Penrose. And he called that the anti-coherent states. So when I, I started that, I was to Roy Glover, I was his postdoc, and then I asked Roy, I am using the name anti-coherent state. I said, no way. Anti-anything is bad in physics. I said, I said, okay, give me the name. I said, you are Spanish, okay? So you have a king. So you are going for the kings of quantumness. Okay, so we go for the kings of quantumness. So they are the states that point the most opposite to these guys. So for that, we need to define something which are called the state multiples. There are books, especially there is a Russian book, this Varshalovich, Moscow, uh, you know the book on angular momentum, which is the best one. And then there's the way to decompose a state, a, ma a density matrix in terms of something that is called multiples. But forget about the idea. The idea can be used, can be very simplified if you use just uh, the constellation. So what is the, f the uh, uh, you remember the multiples in electrostatics, OK? You take the density, this is the charge, and you take the average value of, of what? And here is a unit direction, okay? It's theta phi. So these are the definition of electrostatics replacing charge by the Q function, by the probability. So this means that the, the, the first order moment is the dipole. What is giving you the dipole? The average direction on the sphere. 
What is giving you the quadrupole? The correlations over directions. What is giving you the octopole? Even more correlations. So now the question is, in terms of these multiples, the Q function, so the, 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 C, the Q function again is the probability over the sphere of your state, can be expressed in this way. It's just uh, spherical harmonics, some ugly coefficients that are called klebs gurdan but you have these multiples. And what's the point in that? When you have the Q function, when you have the whole probability distribution, you have all the moments. These are the moments. So the Q function conveys the whole information because it's giving you the whole moments of the distribution. Now the question is, let, let, me, let me show an, an example of this. You, we've seen before in Marco talk about the states in an OPO. And he talked about two kinds of states. Two modes in the horizontal mode, two photons in the horizontal mode, none of the vertical one, for example, or the other way around. If you remember this way to pass from two mode problems to total spin, you'll see that this state corresponds to spin one, total number of photons two, spin one, and difference between this divided by two, spin one. So I can cal calculate the Q function in this way. And look, you have a monopole, it's a constant term. You have a dipole, this is just the average value of your state, and you have a quadrupole. And you sum up, and this is the typical distribution of this state. Look, it's very concentrated in the North Pole, negative in the South Pole, and has a good valley. Good? Let's now go to this state. One photon is, is OPO type two, okay? Type two, yeah. So the polarizations are orthogonal. But you have one photon in the horizontal polarization, one photon in the vertical one. So now spin is one again, total number of photons is two, but M is equal zero. So the first order, the polaris, this first order, the dipole, the average value is zero. We say, look, this state is unpolarized. This was the, the state that was a first time considered by David Klitschko, and he called that hidden polarization. I think the name was a bit disgusting. I'm sorry for that, but I mean, the, the idea was completely hidden polarization. No, hidden because you didn't check properly. I mean, all the, all the information was in the second order moments, and you didn't look at that. But of course, if you make any experimental test on this state, and we did in, in, in Stockholm, this state is unpolarized. And this state, is probably, from the point of view of Marco, is the most quantum state produced by an OPO. Why? Because all the information is in the higher order moments. So the message I want to convey is classical states convey information in low order moments, in fact, in first order moments and quantum states convey information in the opposite way. So in a way, this is just this, the total number of multiples. Look, this is a coherent state, a classical coherent state. Okay? Look at that. This is the average number of photons. This state, this is the multiples. This state has all the information contained in the first order. And this is the idea that you can plot a state in the Poincare sphere, on the Bloch sphere. It's a point in the Bloch sphere. The point is the average value. And the fluctuations are encoded in these guys, a bit second order moments. However, look at these states. These states are precisely the Dicke states. I mean, S, M. 
the most, okay, one of these candidates to be the most ones. Look, there is, this is the number of photons, and look at the multiples. All of them are zero, that's the, the highest one. So the information is conveyed in this. So we were looking for that, and then we look at for what is the cumulative distribution of these multiples. So the sum of all these multiples. And then we have a conjecture that now is proved, we published, is this SU2 coherent states maximize the multiples. How is then the minima? Okay. We need to find pure states that minimize that, so that kill all the multiples to a given order. And this is a terrible semi-analytical task that was uh, done by Marcus Grassel. And this, these are the constellations of the kings of quantumness. So these are the Q functions, okay? Deep blue are the zeros of the Q function. So instead of looking at the, at the zeros at maximum, you, we look at where the zeros are. And these are the Majorana constellations, okay? You see the octahedron, the dodecahedron, the high cos So this is for different spins for different number of photons. So from that point of view, this is, these guys have the maximal, the, the maximal fluctuations in the higher order moments. They, they are unpolarized, not to first order. They are unpolarized to second order, to third order, to fourth order, to maximum order. And then out of the blue, all the information is conveyed in higher order fluctuations. So there is, uh, how much time? Because I want to, 30 minutes, 30. Okay, I will skip this. Uh, the designs. And now the question is, look, I want to, to look at these states also from, from making, we are in a quantum technology conference. We want to make something that can be useful, can be implemented, okay? And then we were thinking, what to do with these states, okay? What we can do is just to determine rotations. And you can say, who is interested in determining rotations? There are tons of problems that are related to re determine a rotation. When you determine a magnetic field, you are measuring a rotation. When you make polarimetry, when you make a phase shift in interferometry, you are measuring a rotation. So can we make a optimal sensing, optimal metrology with those states in comparison to the classical ones? And the answer is, I hope so. So the classical estimation theory, I will skip these talks, these uh, uh, slides, because tomorrow probably Zdenek will enter with much more detail, okay? So we have a parameter source, we have an observation channel, we accumulate some uh, data from X that is a conditional probability of observing this x provided that the true value of the parameter is theta, and from that we get an estimator, okay? And the estimator is just a function that allows us to predict a value of the parameter which is not directly available to measurements, okay? So in a way, there is a, a likelihood function which is just putting this, this joint distribution but not as a function of the data, but as a function of the parameter. And the idea is, how well can I estimate? How well can I estimate this parameter? If you look at this, okay, when you, this is the parameter theta, I'm sorry for the quality of this PDF, okay? So there is no dependence of this data of, of, A, of theta. However, in this guy, we have a strong dependence on theta. So what is the, how, the, how to determine how well we can estimate the parameter. The idea is, due to Fisher, is to measure the curvature. So the, the Fisher information is taking the second derivative of this function 
In fact, we take the logarithm of this because in many cases we have Gaussians and we want to get rid of the exponential, okay? But we take the second derivative, so we are looking for the curvature of the curve. And then high, higher curvature means better accuracy. So the Fisher information is nothing more than the curvature of your data, period. Okay, now we know that in the quantum, in the quantum world, you have a state, you have a parameter, and then from the parameter you infer, you make from the measurements, this distribution. The only difference with the quantum world is that, of course, in this quantum world, you take the derivative, and then this Fisher information dep depends both on the source, the state you have, and of course, on the measurement scheme you have. Because for a different scheme, this observation channel changes your probability. Now imagine that this, uh, this you, you take this Fisher information, but then this probability is obtained through the Born rule. And we call that a POVM, but forget about it, it's just a, a projector. And we optimize over all the strategies. Then when we optimize over all the strategies, you get a, a quantum Fisher information that depends only on the state, not on the measurement. This is the problem, or this is the advantage. And of course, we know that for any unbiased estimator, we have this Kramer bound. You cannot do better than the inverse of the Fisher information. We know that. So now imagine I want to make this for pure states. So I have a pure state. I have a process which is unitary, and then the pure state is modified, and this process is unitary, so it's, it's the exponential of something which is called the generator. This, for, this generator can be Hamiltonian for time, everything, okay? So for a pure state, the Fisher information is giving you just the variance of the generator. Okay, so this means that imagine I have a state and I make a rotation of the state. So if the axis of the state of the rotation is now, it's just an angle of rotation which we need to determine. And an angle of rotation is what people call a phase shift. Okay, okay. Now we want to optimize this guy. What are the states? Remember, quantum physical information is independent of the measurement. And you can say, what are the states that optimize quantum physical information for a rotation? And then the answer is, is very simple. Okay, you need to put this rotation, and this rotation, let's say the rotation is around a set, the, the set axis. So the state is the one who optimizes what? The variance. The variance of what? Of the generator. And what is the generator of rotation around the set axis? S set. What are the probability distribution that optimizes the variance? And this, you go to the department in front of you and you ask, this is a problem? I said, no, this is well-known statistics. The, op the states that optimize the variance are the states that have only two components, the first and the last. The first and the last, again, a noon state. This is a noon state when you write in the proper number basis, if you want. And look, you can, you, we can understand what these states are good. Imagine all these experiments Marco was telling us. Essentially, you are making an interference, okay? And this means an interference means you, you have your state and you want to make an operation that makes the state orthogonal to itself. This is measuring an interference in a way, okay? So imagine you have a coherent state. A coherent state points in mostly in one direction. And you want to make a coherent state orthogonal to itself. What you need to do? 
the, the biggest rotation you can imagine. So it's the ugliest state to make interferometry because you need to, pro to, to do the maximal rotation. However, this state is orthogonal to itself whenever this, is, uh, whenever this state goes to this one. So rotation over what? 2 pi over the number of maxima. So if we get an, a noon state with n components, you need to only rotate the state 2 pi over n, and you get a sensitivity which is 1 over n, the Heisenberg limit. So they are good. But the problem is they are good because we know the axis of rotation. Imagine you don't know the axis of rotation. So to put in a different, in a different way, if you, if you have a, a magnetometer, you need to, you, are, you want to make a determination of the magnetic field. So what you do is in, the, in, a, in an interferometer, you measure the rotation. But this, the, the phase shift caused, caused by the magnetic field. But this phase shift is only a phase shift when you know the axis. That, that means that you need to know the direction of the magnetic field. And those, all these magnetometers are not sensing the direction of the magnetic field, only the magnitude of the magnetic field. We want to have a state that optimizes, that optimizes the sensitivity for every direction, independent of what. So this means that we want to optimize the Fisher information over all the axis of rotation. This is a terrible optimization problem. But again, these are, they are similar to the other ones. I mean, especially when the, when the constellation has symmetry. Of course, rotating around the symmetry, you, you can imagine that it, more or less you rotate around any of these axes and the sensitivity is roughly the same. And now comes, I'm coming to, to the end. Now comes a question now. And this is, I don't know the answer. But look, we know that the Fisher information for a pure state is giving you only the variance. So the Fisher information is giving you the fluctuations in second order. But we know that for quantum states, fluctuations in second order are in principle not enough. So this means that quantum Fisher, info, or Fisher information in general is not given the proper information at the quantum level. We need to have some higher order quantum information, quantum Fisher information. So quite recently, uh, the first, I mean, people is starting to realize that certainly Fisher information is not enough. Uh, the group of Marco Barbieri in Rome has published the first attempt to consider Fisher information, including fourth order moments. And uh, way work is in progress on that. But the idea is all this quantum metrology has been so far constructed in terms of Fisher information. And if we really want to go to the quantum realm, we need to go farther than that. And uh, with that, I yeah, show you that we did the experiment. Bob Boyd did the experiment to show explicitly the states that optimize over all these directions. So I'm not the person to ask details about the experiments, OK? They keep me away from the lab, and I'm happy with that. So the idea is um, we generate a single photon uh, from a single photon pairs in an OPO. We generate pairs. In one of them, we use an orbital angular momentum. We generate the states. And in the other, the other photon, we use the other photon to compute the overlap between the original state and the rotated state. So this overlap is represented here for these dimensions. And these are the experimental points that show that indeed 
we are at the Heisenberg limit for this experiment with any direction of rotation. So, can we do that better with higher order moments? I think so, but work is in progress. So I expect to be invited for the next school and then report on the higher order moments, okay? <laughs> on the other hand, let me say that, again, there are other fields. For example, we were told about quantum co error correction codes. A quantum error correction code is just something that kills multiples. So a good quantum error correction code kills as much possible, as much moment as of in, the, in the density matrix. So they are kings of quantumness. And uh, this, this, uh, this concept of Majorana constellations that is transferring the characteristic of the states to such a beautiful construction, points on the sphere, that then you can use many tools that are very efficient to control the state. And with that, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. We have a lot of time for questions. Please. Questions? It's not. Is it recognized by everybody? Because uh, uh, n n I hope I'm saying not yet, but not especially yet. I mean, it's given. Is is enough? It's enough if you really are happy with the second order moments. Fisher information is giving you the variance of the generator. Nothing more for pure states. Okay. For example, for, we did some experiments in Paderborn recently. Okay. And we, it's just Fisher information in the temporal resolution. And we check it and we are at the quantum limit. Marco Barbieri asked for the data and they check it the fourth order moments and we are not in the fourth order moments at the quantum limit. We are saturating something but not the quantum Fisher information at fourth order moments. So one should include higher order moments. In which way? I mean, we have some ideas, but still, but, but for sure, I mean, for these exotic states, non-Gaussian states, I mean, for Gaussian states, I mean, everything is, is okay. But for non-Gaussian states in which you can, um, I mean, the, in, in states in which the higher order moments play a role. For example, noon states are unpolarized. Yes, but, um if you just take, uh, yes, uh, exotic states, non-Gaussian states, noon states, cat states, etc., the standard wisdom is that you can do it. Uh, uh, well, there are paper by caves, and the company. Uh, so you, you don't agree with that? Or? Well, I agree. I agree. Okay. No, I, 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 I'm saying that, <clears throat> again, it's the problem with Klitschko. I mean, they say this state is hidden, hidden, has hidden polarization. They call, didn't look at higher order moments. If you look at higher order moments, you need to take that into account. I mean, if you are happy with second order moments, look, Fisher information is your, is your tool. Okay, well, <laughs> I will revise my standard wisdom then. <laughs> so I probably missed the, the, the answer. So probably, going, no. going, going back to the continuous variables, what are the kings of quantumness there? Well, the, the, in, in that particular way, that's the, the answer is only, okay, so again, I have three different answers to my original question. What is the most opposite to a classical state? One is in terms of, the most opposite in terms of entropy. Well, entropy is minimal for a coherent state. What is maximal? So we have, these states, uh, uh, these states, these states were uh, is work in progress by Ingemar Benson in Stockholm. It's a student, Anna Bergrum, who is doing that. So, for for some of these dimensions, 
these states coincide with these kings of quantumness. What are kings of quantumness? Are states that kill multiples as much as possible. And, uh, and the third one is, what are the states that are optimal for estimating rotations? The, the, the worst ones are coherent. The best ones are those ones. So there are three. So for what is the answer for continuous variables? The answer is, we don't have multiples for continuous variables because the, the, we have infinite number of multiples. So we cannot kill these multiples. So the only answer I have is, in terms of entropy, number states are the most opposite to coherent states. One more question. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I just wonder, why do you use moments instead of cumulants? Because cumulants have uh, nice, uh, very nice uh, properties in this sense. Um, I, I agree in the comment and I disagree here, okay? Because uh, these moments, these uh, moments are, were constructed by Stratonovich because they, you need to have good properties and the rotations. We go, we, you want to construct properties that are invariant and they rotate in the state. Cumulants are not. And this, these moments are constructed in this way. Uh, they are called irreducible tensorial sets. And they were constructed by Fano and all these guys, Stratonovich, to do the proper job in atomic physics. So this is why we use that. Um, I want to clear some things out. Um, so the, the maximum quantum states were, we were looking uh, among the states which have uh, like a tensor product of two vectors, right? I mean, the, oh, okay. My thing straight. Um, uh, all the vectors of uh, for the states were uh, oh, two uh, tensor products of two vectors, right? This one? No, I mean uh, they were like uh, s uh, comma s oh, no, in no, no, brackets. No, 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 so no. they were like tensor product of two spaces. No, no. Look, in, in fact, <coughs> no. <coughs> ah, the projection and the ah, okay. So in, the in fact. Of, uh, uh, but you, you were talking about the two-node uh, uh, field, uh, yeah. the, like so. Basically, those uh, two-node fields are different. Uh, different a, a tensor product, tensor product of two modes. Yeah, they are modes. independent modes, like yeah. horizontal, vertical, and polarization. Uh, so from the two, two t from the tensor product, we made a single space, and then we are looking in the space. Okay. If you look from that point of view of two tensor products, we are looking at the <coughs> symmetric subspace. This is the symmetric subspace of two qubits. <coughs> okay, and could you please also show, I, I missed a little bit, how is uh, Fisher information connected to the uh, entropy? Uh, the entropy? Well, yeah. not the, to it, the entropy. I mean, uh, the Fisher information is, is just connected to the variance of the, uh, the variance of the generator. The quantum Fisher information is the variance of the generator of the transformation. Okay. If you make a rotation, the generator of the transformation is the angular momentum, a set. And then this is the variance of a set. Okay, I just missed that uh, no, you were talking about the extremal quantum states uh, that maximize the, en the entropy, yeah. and now we're talking about yeah, the states that minimize concepts. the variance. Probably one is maximal entropy, <laughs> maximal multiple skilling, and maximal Fisher information. So these three concepts give rise to three different but, quantumness. But in all cases, the Majorana... The Majorana constellations look very much the same. I'm only, of course, as always in the paper, I almost put in the nice pictures, not the worst cases. Of course, this is just for the students. Yeah, but the Majorana constellations are much more the same. Okay. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, please, probably I just missed the idea, but uh, can you give some more details about how are you going to use this method in uh, quantum error cor correction algorithms? Okay. Well, I mean, this is uh, not my, uh, my idea, but uh, the guy who did all this, I'm not computer scientist, nothing like that, but Marcus Grassel, the guy who did this optimization, he's a computer scientist. 
Okay, so the idea is precisely that when you have a quantum error correction code, you need, well, it's what, uh, roughly speaking, okay, you need to, uh, you span your density matrix in the proper basis, and then you need to kill as much as possible the, the coefficients in that, in that basis. So this is corresponds to kill multiples, okay? Okay. And this is a quantum okay. error correction code. The optimal is the one that kills as, as multiples as possible. Okay, thank you. Okay, it seems there is no more question. So uh, thank you thank very you much for the presentation. Thank you.